It's a motion to strike the action because they never want to deal with the substance. The government never really wants to deal. Uh, in the early days, you know, cases were, that were challenging the abortion laws were struck before Morgan Taylor was finally successful, to give you an idea. And people just kept coming back and coming. And that's how, the, that's, that's how it works. Uh, and so it's, it, they're saying, please don't hear any of this. So if they don't strike it on the basis that, let's say they, they're saying there's no reasonable cause of action. Well, they can't put in their statement of defense, there's no reasonable cause of action. They've spent that, that fuel. They actually have to justify why they haven't been giving loans, interest-free loans to the government, uh, to, to, to the governments. They have to justify why the minutes of these meetings in Zurich are kept secret. And they have to justify why the Minister of Justice is not, uh, is not tabling the true figures of revenue coming in. And they have to justify it in law, not, well, he doesn't want to. That's not an answer. He has a duty. They have to justify why that duty is not being fulfilled. So, do you have any idea when this when this case might actually be heard? When when these when these pretrial motions will be out of the way? If it's not struck, it will be in probably seven eight months. Even if they appeal, it gets up there pretty quick to the court of appeal and Supreme Court pretty quick from the federal court. Let's say they lose and they appeal, or vice versa. We'll, we'll, we'll have a word from the Supreme Court uh, before next uh, summer, and then the case goes forward if it goes forward. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not discounting the possibility that the courts will be completely dishonest and say, this is too big for us, we don't want to touch it. That's always a possibility. That doesn't mean the case doesn't have solid legal ground. It just means that the, court, that the courts are being dishonest. Sometimes they are. That happens. And? mentioned that there was, when he was trying to pass his budget, he mentioned that there was only six members of the House of Commons who understood the budget, and I think that they're dumber now. That many? There were six, yeah. yeah. I, well, I, I, think, I think Tommy Douglas is one of them. Yeah, I see that. Don't assume your MPs know anything. They don't. And I hate to say that, because I've often, you know, gone, when I go up to Ottawa to uh, make submissions before parliamentary committees, and, and, uh, and uh, Senate committees on legislation. Uh, you know, on the anti-terrorism bill, a lot of them came to me quite and said, you're gonna challenge this stuff and fix it, aren't you? I said, what are you talking about? You're passing the law, you're the people who are supposed to fix it. They don't understand it. No. They don't know who to believe. And very few of them understand it, which is a tragedy. It's a tragedy. It's, it's, it's a signal to the government, but who are you electing? And so, yeah, you're quite right. A lot of them do not know what the budget is about. And, and they don't know the authority that they are, is vested in them as MPs with respect to the budgetary process that they're supposed to exercise. They just stand up and sit down when they're supposed to. Before I monopolize it, I just have one more thing, item I wanted to mention. And that is the debate between whether money is a commodity or an abstract has not yet been met. And I would be very interested in hearing your viewpoint. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that's a much... Or take a pass, it doesn't matter. No, I don't, I don't want to, you know, that'd be, that'd be the cheap thing to do. It, it's a really complicated issue, and it's an issue in which not just governments, but citizens have their head in the sand about. You know, they, th they hear the word money, and they think they know what money is. And of course, they confuse it with currency and electronic entries in a computer somewhere. And they confuse the money that comes from blood, sweat, and tears through labor with money that's just printed by fraud artists at institutions. So it's a very, very large, large uh, topic. If I give you, or, you know, more to the point, if my father gave you $100, he sweated it out on the construction site on which he died of asbestosis for that $100. And if the banker gives me $100, what does it mean? What's it mean? They could have printed it. I mean, it's not the same thing. So, uh, I, you know, one point is, although it was an artificial standard, the gold standard was abandoned in 73, has to be put into the mix. I, I, I really can't, I really uh, don't want to engage in a, in, in a discussion like that because it's, it's not ne going to necessarily enter the case. It may, if the government raises that issue, we'll have to call experts on it. It may. But, uh, we're, we're, in my view, we're in a real pickle. You know, the only money I have in the bank has a, a minus sign in front of it. 
I owe them. No dollar sign. No, no. I owe them mm -hmm. because it's it's uh, you know anyway. So it's a larger it's a larger issue. I, I people want to pick up the discussion. Fair enough, but I, I really, as a lawyer on this case, it's a bit off to the side for me at this at this stage. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Doesn't the Bank Act say that the money that the Bank of Canada lends has to be amortizable? In other words, it has to be like a toll bridge, okay? It can lend for a toll bridge, maybe not for a school, but yeah, I, because there's no revenues coming directly from the school. I can't, I, I, I'm not going to lie to you either. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. I don't commit these things to memory. Okay. What the bank, that on the portion of the Bank Act that we're, we're tackling, what it says is you can, you can lend up to a third of the annual budget so long as that third is paid in the next fiscal year. And some people say, well, what's the point? Well, the point is easy. The government, obviously, if it's running only $40 billion in interest charges on a $240 billion debt, can pay that in the first, uh, in, in the next fiscal year, up to a third of that budget, obviously, because it's got $200 billion coming in, right? Secondly, by doing that, you avoid interest. You save yourself $40 billion a year. Rocco, if, sure. if, if you'll permit me some latitude on this, this is a broad no, issue. <laughs> but your honor, um, I've, I've been involved, uh, I was the former Toronto Area Coordinator for the Council of Canadians, we fought the FTA, we fought NAFTA, now we're uh, in, in another capacity, we're facing CETA, and then there's the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. All these treaties and agreements that are then federal governments are committing the country to, what is the relationship and the priority with regard to their constitutional responsibilities to this country? In other words, if the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, uh, makes an agreement among the various central bank governors that everybody's going to do this, does that take precedence over our constitution? Well, you ask another complicated question, which you're forcing me into. Okay, if that's no, 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 no. I'm going to answer, but I have to slow down for you. Okay. When you're looking at treaties, there are two types of treaties. You have to draw a very broad line between. There are treaties that are as between governments and government institutions and organizations, and then there are treaties that, for lack of a better word, just for a broad stroke, are human rights treaties that are supposed to be there for the protection of individuals and human rights. I'll just take the human rights treaties out of the way so you understand, because otherwise, I don't know how much you know, so it may confuse you if I don't, if I don't explain the difference. With human rights treaties, uh, I was one of the two counsel who uh, convinced the Supreme Court of Canada in a case called Baker that a treaty that grants rights that we sign that recognizes rights that attach to an individual. When you're interpreting your domestic law, you have to interpret it in accordance with those international treaty rights. And then another case went a bit further, a case called HAPE, and said that when you're dealing with rights of an individual under a treaty, even if, even if we haven't ratified it in Parliament, those human rights protections are the minimum protections you have to read into Section 7 of the Charter, uh, Life, Liberty, and Security of the Person, okay? Now, with treaties that are not dealing with human rights, the one you're, you're, you're referring to, the law is a treaty that we sign, that the executive signs without being ratified in Parliament, is not domestic law. So that if the execution of that treaty by the executive within the executive power, not all, not, not, not everything the government does has to go through parliament, but if that what they're doing with the treaty breaches a statute of the Parliament of Canada or the Constitution, well that has to give way to domestic law. Even if, that, now if parliament, if parliament enacts the treaty <coughs> as, as part of the domestic law, then if that treaty contravenes another statute of parliament, the law says you have to reconcile them, you have to interpret them in a way that's cohesive because they're both acts of parliament. Or if they're not, then you've got a problem. 
so that the courts will try to read them in concert so that they both make sense. If the treaty that's been ratified by Parliament, which is domestic law, infringes a constitutional requirement, then it's of no force. The treaty cannot, the Parliament can broker anything except the Constitution. You can't broker away constitutional rights and requirements without a constitutional amendment. So even a treaty that's ratified by the House of Commons has to give way to the domestic constitution. Okay. So for, I, I, a good example is a few years ago, I didn't, I didn't end up taking this thing on, but you know, this, this whole idea that the post office was a monopoly and that these courier companies were complaining that our, po well, our post office is constitutionally enumerated in Section 91. The federal government has an obligation to run a post office. I say that no courier company under NAFTA or any trade agreement could complain about our post office, even if it's subsidized 100%, because the government has a constitutional duty to run a post office, and they can run it in any way they want. They can't. In other words, if they decided tomorrow we're going to get rid of a post office, I don't think they can do that. They can, they can, uh, they can uh, hire private interest to run the post office for them, or, but they have to have a public post office. It's in the Constitution. Okay? So, just as a, a simple example. Thank you. Okay? Yeah. Okay, just an addendum to what was just being said about the free trade agreements. <coughs> Read the post office. Would that stop? an American company under the free trade agreement from suing the Canadian government. What's the argument? That's more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got time. <laughs> no. And that's because the government was stupid enough to, to breach their own constitution. As between governments, if there's a treaty, if there's a treaty to 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 um, resolve disputes as between governments and the government was stupid enough not to have a clause saying save and accept anything that's not constitutionally permissible without a government. Most treaties have that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But our government in the last few years has been so arrogant, I don't know if they put that, that, that okay. clause in. So if they don't have a clause, an exception for anything their courts deem unconstitutional, which I doubt because the, Ameri the Americans always do that because they know if their courts say this is unconstitutional, they're not going to want to pay out. Okay. So, so uh, uh, that doesn't extinguish the the obligations under that treaty, and they have their own tribunal to deal with it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when I was involved with the Council of Canadians, and uh, NAFTA was being negotiated, uh, the Council took a poll of Parliament, and not one single MP had read no. the NAFTA no. agreement. Yeah, yeah that's right. So that's right. Maybe the enabling legislation but not the agreement itself. You mentioned the human rights treaties and then kind of put them off to the side. And I know that NAFTA is in massive breach and violation of like, the, econo or, sorry, the international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. And when it comes down to like if a legal case proposed between those, what is the, the power play between two international agreements between countries? Well, that's interesting. I had a case like that. I, am going, I have a case like that. I'm, I'm, uh, the latest a, te a test case that I'm running is uh, I, I was the one who established uh, uh, being gay as a basis and being a victim of domestic violence as being basis to claim refugee status. Uh, it's not in. I had it read in. Uh, the next door I'm trying to open is environmental refugees in the Nigeria uh, petroleum delta. So what you have is you have multinational companies going in. They displace massive. Uh, massive, massive uh, uh, populations, and and uh, I'm saying that well, then they're environmental refugees, and it's more more uh, uh, egregious because we had a hand in some of some of the companies are Canadian in forcing them to flee, and they got nowhere to go. So if they come here, they make a refugee status. They have rights under the UN Convention to refugee status. They're going to they're claiming well, we have we have treaties, we have economic treaties. So I think where, where, the, where it plays out is that once you hook the government of Canada into the litigation, then the Human Rights Treaty has to take precedence. Because it's a charter, it's a charter, charter violation. And so human rights treaties always have to take precedence over economic treaties. So because of our charter. Yeah, yeah, it's a charter. So it says in our charter. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, no, because the, the cases I mentioned say that the international protections are minimal, are to be read in minimal as minimal protection under Section 7 of the Charter. So char they become charter rights. Those international human rights protections become Canadian charter rights when you interpret Section 7 of the Charter. And of course, corporations don't have charter rights. Okay, they don't. A corporation, you know, tell you a true story, uh, just for a bit of uh, comic relief. I was out in Peterborough doing a tax evasion trial. Well, you, you remember my daughter would come to my cases. I, ra I raised my daughter by myself uh, as a single father. You remember Miranda coming to cases in Vancouver? We're out there, and she's sitting in the front row. She's nine years old, and I said to the Crown, I had this huge constitutional argument that was going to make their case go away. I said, I'll tell you what, the corporation will plead guilty, pay the taxes and the fine if you don't prosecute the two directors who are looking at jail time. And the Crown said, okay, walked off, they were cutting the deal, I'm like, and he came back, and my daughter, nine years old, said, what are you, stupid? You fell for that from my dad? <laughs> she said, what are we going to do, put the Coca-Cola can in the jail cell? Shareholders. <laughs> 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 and, and so, of course, the corporations don't have charter rights because they're not biological beings, right? So. And, and then I, <laughs> You know, I love <laughs> Not yet. Children can see the, the, the children can see the, 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 the ridiculous artificial nature of those constructs that are just not geared for human beings, you know, and uh, including the financial system. You know. Just if I can make just a comment, it was Benjamin Disraeli. Some of these quotes, they just sort of stick in my head. Benjamin Disraeli said that if people knew how they were governed, it would be a revolution today, not tomorrow. <laughs> what I like was from Machiavelli that the, uh, the, the, the despot's power is most secure when the citizens believe and declare themselves to be free. I think that's the situation we're in. This, this fallacy about voting once every four years. We think we're as free as the wind. I mean, people confuse the presence of violence with dictatorial governance. You don't have to have violence to have dictatorial governance. And you can have pathological levels of violence and still have the most vibrant democracy. The states had that for years. They were the most vibrant democracy on the face of the earth, the most violent society on the face of the earth. One is not, you know, one doesn't get equated with the other. And when I talk about it, you know, Canada being a dictatorship, people get their backs up. I don't know why. It's a quiet it's a dictatorship with a smile. Is there any likelihood, feasibility, possibility that corporations will one day lose their status as a legal person? I don't know. I don't know. I, like I've had this discussion. I have this in a factum that I did for Connie years ago. People don't know how old this debate is. 1890-something? No. But isn't that when the judge declared a corporation? No, no. Adam Smith, when they proposed that a corporation have status outside the realm, said, are you insane? It's created by the domestic government. You can't have a corporation go on that, that, that has status beyond its borders. In 1618, a case went to the English courts called Sutton's Hospital, where they tried to get a corporation to have extraterritorial status, and the court said, are you insane? 1973, the World Court was the last time they tried it, and the World Court rejected it. Now they finally succeeded in giving corporations, through these government treaties, rights to cross borders. And in the Criminal Code of Canada, they've slipped it in now that you can be engaging in an act of terrorism if it's against a corporation. I predict the corporation will have the right to vote in my if my daughter has grandchildren. She's looked at the world and decided that she's not going to have children. So. You're distinguishing, you see, <laughs> distinguishing between their present right to buy the vote yeah. to an actual vote yeah. in the actual elections. So, uh, given that answer, I, I'm not hopeful that they're going to disappear. The original corporations, if I'm not mistaken, they were set up with the idea that they would be a benefit to the crown, right? And to individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they don't pay taxes, they're not very much of a benefit, I don't think. Bill. I'll take you back to Barcelona. I'll be going there again. Are you back? 
at the extreme north, there's a mountain very high, dedicated to God. It's called TB Dabo, I will give unto you. And some in the late 30s, I and a friend stood at the corresponding height and watched the Nazis, German Nazis who had just come to power, bombing the statue, raised to the glory of God, practicing dropping bombs for the coming up war. Now, unless we define what is at stake, economically, we're leaving the job half done. What is at stake economically if we leave the job, no matter how well done, and you're doing a, a very excellent job at it, it'll come apart. And the important thing is that what is debt, what is capital, what is taxes about, what is investment in human capital without which you couldn't get off the sidewalk in, in any country. So long as that is not, now we have to come to your help and you understand this far better than most of us here, certainly the legal aspects. But those legal aspects must come to an expression of hard-nosed economics. And otherwise we will be preparing for the next world war by bombing Tibidabo, which, uh, which is dedicated to the good Lord, not the fault of the good Lord. We have to define that investment in education, in health, and just in human happiness is an investment, not only and not even, not even principally an expense. Now, our excellent lawyer understands this as well as I do, but the problem is you have to move from one sphere to the other. And that takes not only a lot of law, but on what human capital is about. No matter what they say the law is, unless that law <coughs> recognizes that education, health, the welfare of humanity is what is at stake, it'll be evading the point. And, and, and that can be conveyed, though, because often, you know, as a constitutional lawyer, I have to remind judges and lawyers and citizens that, you know, taxation, Taxation is at the basis of every single constitution in the West that we hold dear. The French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Magna Carta. It came out of taxation that we have these individual charter rights. And really, what's taxation? Taxation, in simple terms, is the exacting of human labor by the government, of the citizen, and then the redistribution of that human labor to a currency system, a monetary system. That's all it is. But tied to it are revolutions and conflicts that had to be waged at, 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 at an incredible cost to make sure that that was equitable to the human being, to the citizen. Without an educated workforce, you can't run a modern society. Bill, I, I, if, if I may, I know Rocco is on a very tight schedule. And uh, I'd like to thank him personally for, for sparing us the time and the wisdom. Humor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>